Hello, and welcome to the Citizens of Craft podcast, where we explore the objects we love, the reasons we love them, and the people who bring them to life. I'm your host, Megan Black. In my job as the director of the Canadian Crafts Federation, I have the absolute honor of meeting craftspeople from across Canada and beyond who dedicate their lives to the creation of artistic, skillful, and captivating objects woodworkers, glass sculptors, jewelers and potters, textile artists, fashion designers, furniture makers, and more. You name it, there's someone out there making it and making it well. These are the citizens of craft. They are masters in their own right, chasing techniques that have been in use for thousands of years and exploring new technologies that have just begun to push the boundaries of art. They create objects with meaning, history, and purpose, rejecting the mass manufactured lifestyle of our time to capture something more authentic, something that fascinates, something that matters, something that tells the story of who we are. Join me as we explore that story through the 10 manifesto statements of the Citizens of Craft movement, from you are not a lemming, to cookie cutter doesn't cut it, and vases are people too. We'll discuss these ideas and so much more by talking with the people who bring them to life, the Citizens of Craft. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to today's episode, the fourth session of the Citizens of Craft podcast. A a fun fact to start us off today, the the Canadian Crafts Federation headquarters, where I am located today, are based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Uh, Last night, we had quite the windstorm that affected the entire province. Now, now everyone is safe and sound, as far as I know, um, but the power is still out. There's lots of trees down, and, and yes, we're missing some power throughout the most of the province. Um, However, the craft gods are smiling upon us today as the CCF office is up and running. So we have power throughout the building and I'm very pleased that our recording session can go ahead today. So we've defied the odds for today's session. Now, thank goodness the power is working because this podcast depends on one particularly important tool, the internet, which allows us to bring voices together from across great distances. So I want to give a quick shout out to our excellent podcast partner partners at Voice Ed Radio in Toronto for helping us to make all this magic happen. Now, from the Maritimes to Central Canada and then over to the Prairies, today we have two very different and yet very similar artists joining us for a conversation and craft. Calling in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, we welcome intermedia artist Seema Goyle and hailing from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, we have textile artist Monica kinner Whalen. Thank you so much for both of you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Megan. Now, both of you have come to craft with a bit of a blended background in the sense that you both have extensive training in other fields, which impacts what you do to this very day. Um, so I'm very curious to hear how these educational backgrounds influence the work that you do in craft and then vice versa. But first, let's just set the scene a little bit with some talk about where you are right now and exactly how you got there. So Seema, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're calling in from today, describe your immediate surroundings, and then give a little bit more about how you came to craft. Uh, My immediate surroundings are a bit unusual in that I'm currently hiding out in the mathematics department at the University of Manitoba. (laughs) But Um, I have an office in the University of Manitoba. I'm the STEAM coordinator here. And my Wi-Fi is not as good in my office, so I came up to math. Um, So how my immediate surroundings, so I'm in an office. My office looks pretty similar, except that it is full of crazy materials and sticky notes describing workflow projects for projects that integrate art and science. And lots of whiteboard space with students drawing their ideas about projects connecting art and science and um, kind of general fun with those uh, that conflation. So I have a taxidermy coyote in my office. I have a skeleton that is currently wearing a lab coat. <laughs> I have um, vessels from the 1920s that were recently unearthed from the microbiology department that have been uh, given to me. I have a living wall, so I've got lots of plants around me. And I have giant pictures of people drawing in the herbarium from a recent project that we did. So how did I come to craft? 
Um, that's a that's a kind of a big question. The I came to craft because I picked up a hitchhiker. Really? Yeah. So I I have always been somebody who danced between art and science. I was in the performing arts more so. I was in theater and I studied vocal jazz as well. And I was a creative writer, all those kinds of things. But I came from a science family. So science was something that we understood and was under, was the promoted uh, career path. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. And, but my, but my parents were really open-minded people and they always supported my interests in the arts as well. So when I went off to university, I went with a bit of a conflict between doing art or science. And I got into theater school at York and I also got into the biology program at McGill and I ended up choosing biology, but was always really confused as to whether or not that was the right path to take. And after biology, I ended up uh, living on Salt Spring Island very briefly. And one day I picked up a hitchhiker and they asked me what I did. And I said, oh, I'm a glass blower." And they asked me <laughs> questions about it. And I had all these answers and I dropped them off. And then I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want you to think that I'm like a chronic liar or anything. It just came <laughs> out of my mouth. I don't know what happened. And I called up a studio in Vancouver that was run by Morna Tudor and Jeff Burnett. And I think there was a third person. Um, there was a, a glass studio and they happened to be offering a hot glass weekend workshop that very next weekend. Wow. And I, I signed up. I hopped on the ferry. I went to Morna Tudor's uh, studio and at the end of the weekend, she said, you're a natural. And I uh, applied to go to OCA to enter into their glass blowing program. And like I got out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was almost as though you, you were a craftsperson already. You wanted to be a craftsperson already. You just needed a little existential push to get you there. That's just too funny. Now, I mean, I don't expect you to have the same story, Monica. I am assuming that you came to craft from a completely different direction. But why don't you also give us a, a quick description of where you're calling in from today and then tell us what was what was your pathway to craft? Or should I ask, what was your highway to craft? What did that road look like for you? <laughs> a gravel road for me. <laughs> um, I'm here in my home studio in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And... Hmm. Surrounded by. So I'm in my studio. I am surrounded by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spools of thread um, because you can't mix color like you can with paint. So I need every color possible and I still don't always have the right green. But <laughs> and I have bins and bins and bins of yarn and those are all in clear bins so I can see what colors I need quickly and easily. Um, what else? There's a framing area in the corner. I've got another table that's all sketchbooks. I have a loom and some and a spinning wheel and a drop spindle and lots of needles, lots of sewing machines <laughs> and, pr and pretty lights, party lights. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, so that's where I am. And your other question mm -hmm. was how I came to craft. So... <laughs> I was raised by an artist who I was not raised with craft. I was raised with art quite like, you know, if you're going to draw the line, it was quite distinct. Um, and I've always been artistic. I've always been creative and uh, ingenious and inventive and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and, I, and I know I got that from my mom, but my mom couldn't sew. And I thought people who could sew or weave or, quilt or make rugs I thought they were the ones with the mm. magical skills I thought all, I thought all these aunts and grandmothers were cooler <laughs> than my mom <laughs> but um so 
and I took art all my life. Our neighbor was uh, the local gallery owner. Um, and I would often have tea with a watercolor artist when I was a teenager, um, an older woman that lived down the street. So I was just always, always around art, always took art, but never, ever had anyone put fabric, needle and thread in my hands ever. Um, and when I learned about sewing, it was always patterns and kits. And I found that incredibly mm. difficult and and uninspiring, although I thought sewing was really cool. So, so I became a social worker. <laughs> so, yeah, completely different um, sort of vein. So it was later when I had children, I became a mom in my 30s, and I just needed my babies to have handmade quilts. I don't know where that came from or because I didn't sew. I had never learned how to sew. I never grew up with with any kind of textile, any kind of craft growing up. So um, I taught myself painstakingly how to quilt and I joined a guild and it was like I had this instant, uh, you know, 200 women carrying this, you know, keepers of the craft. This They all had this legacy that they were so open to handing over and, and you know anytime I needed to learn anything they were all just there mm -hmm. teaching me so um that was my art school <laughs> was guilds was local guilds and um and it was like inheriting all these mothers and grandmothers and to to teach me so by the time I was 40 I started embroidery and I joined the Saskatchewan Craft Council and um and I've been doing this ever wow. since. So I guess I, I joke, I'm still on maternity leave. <laughs> My oldest is 19. <laughs> I've just been doing art ever since. Mm -hmm. That's fa uh, you know fascinating. A completely different roads, like we talked about, and two very unexpected roads, of course. So it's, it's so interesting that you both kind of moved from another area of focus, um, always having that desire and that connection to the arts, but not making it necessarily your number one path from the get-go. So it's interesting that you moved from either whether it's sciences or social work to the world of visual arts. And in many ways, this is really a big shift from the theoretical to the tactile. Uh, but there's so many ties that bind these two worlds. So why do you feel that the physical act of making is so important either to you or, or to the world? And how do you think that um, that's different from how other people in your fields or or just out there in the world in general live their lives. Um, so how do you think that the physical act of making is important to you and, and why do you think that's different? And I'm going to start with Seema. Making things has a really integral, is a really integral part of being human. And I mean, I mentioned I, I started in glass, but I moved in through ceramics and then into fiber. And now I do, you know, I also have a spinning mill in my office, which is a nice connection with Monica. Um, and I work in lots and lots of different materials, but the tactile component of them is always at the forefront. And I link that actually, I've, I've tried to understand that through my connection to science as well. Um, basically, I believe that making something is part of our human evolutionary strategy to understand ourselves and the world. And it's also a really important component of our, the way our brains develop. So if we don't have tactile inputs, we don't actually develop the same abilities to problem solve. We problem solve through our fingers. We learn through our fingers. And I can reach into my pocket and tell the difference between two different keys because of how they feel whether that's what they're made out of or their shape or their, you know, um, their, law, their structure. And that kind of information is, um, is, is something that relates to making. We, we learn so much from the process where the material is telling us something and we can only push the material in a direction to a certain point. And then we have to understand that it's a conversation. It's not just me imposing my ideas and my desire onto this thing. This, this substance is going to tell me what it will and will not do, and it will lead me in a new direction. So it's full of its own. Um, it's not just limitations. I don't know how to describe this. It's actually like it has its own sense of knowledge and there's a lot of information within it that can be mined to explore lots of ideas, but I need to be able to listen to that material in order to get anywhere with it. 
Well, it really is a conversation between the artist and the materials in a lot of ways because it's going to respond the way it's going to respond and whether or not you have the skill level or whether or not, again, those those craft gods want to be with you. Sometimes it's coincidence. Sometimes it's, it's skill level. Sometimes it's just things coming together at the right time for something to happen, whether it's an idea or a technical thing. So I definitely understand where you're coming from, the needing to have that tactile intelligence in order to move your ideas or projects forward. Yeah, tactile intelligence is a beautiful phrase for that. Um, and I think also it's very grounding. You know, to make stuff with your hands, there's a lot of forgiveness. You don't have to be thinking everything out with your head. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's okay. It, mm-hmm. It's a really, um, like, it's a really centering place. And I always appreciated that both in the glass studio and in the ceramic studio, that if the maker is not centered, the piece won't work. You can't actually center. So those are two groups of people that happen to be generally very calm, relaxed people because they practice being on center. Mm. And Monica, what do you think about that? The the physical act of making, why is that important and, and why is it important to you? Um, yeah, I, I love this conversation so much. It's interesting because Seema's talking science and, and for me, um, that innate, that innate human connection that happens um, that's in our DNA. It's also very social, right? So I've used um, the tactile different crafts in different circles um, therapeutically, right? So with with um, refugees, with people who couldn't even speak English, with children, with very young children, with special needs children, and with elderly people, and even groups of men. And, and something happens when they're all sitting there busy with their hands. There's um, there's a deeper connection. Um, and for me, it's social and therapeutic, but it's obviously science too, right? So um, it's, it is very healing and very grounding and it's, and it goes back so much further than we can imagine, I think, you know, so, um, and I don't know if it's us and them. When you first posed your question, you kind of said what makes us different from other people, but I think everybody, <sighs> gets that sense when they work with their hands and even though some people might have you know full-time jobs doing other work office work or whatever they still might have something they like to tinker with or what you might call a hobby right um that's still this drawn to making so i think even you know that person that needs the bread at home they're engaging that material and they feel that I was uh, listening to a speaker at the Canadian Crafts Federation Conference, the placemaking conference that just took place in Nova Scotia not that long ago. Uh, Carrie Allison is an, um, an artist who works with beading, and she does public art programs and encourages people to engage and and pick up the, the skills of beading. So she teaches them or people have those skills and they come out. And she was talking about the fact that when people are learning a new skill or when they're practicing a hand skill, they drop their guard, they drop their emotional guard a little bit. So people were able to have more open conversations about, you know, either issues that they're dealing with or um, differences of opinion because their hands were busy. So their hearts were open. And I think that goes way back in time. These people in circles communicating with each other, right? Like the community that's created with that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I also read an article recently on BBC, and I'm interested to know what you think of this, Seema, specifically, um, about the lack of manual dexterity that medical students are struggling with, because craft skills aren't, they're not as readily taught in, in schools or at home so much anymore when people are growing up. Um, but so much of our modern tactile actions are focused on, you know, swiping and clicking instead of sewing or building with our hands. And it's something that's become a, a concern in the medical community when it comes to actually, you know, having doctors who have the dexterity to stitch someone together. Um, So I think that's one small example of the value of including arts in science and technology courses and the idea of changing STEM to STEAM. Um, So Seema, you've done quite a bit of work in this field and, and, you know, you're working in the math office right now. So can, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done and your thoughts on that whole idea? Uh, I'm so interested to read that article now. I hope you'll send it to me. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I find is that the students really appreciate being able to engage the disciplines that they've been immersed in for however many years to engage those in other ways and realize that they uh, 
you know, they have something to contribute. So in the way that I work, I'm, I'm creating projects that are based around the sciences, that explore the sciences, but we use the arts as communication forms and we get the students to um, kind of find the delight again in their disciplines. Mm. In, in terms of what you're talking about with developing skill and manual dexterity, um, I mean, I, I think that we all need to continuously develop those things. And I hadn't really thought very much about how that relates to what's happening in science, but it does make sense. Um, although I'm not sure that the majority of people who end up in medical school throughout history really ever had that much experience with sewing, for example, mm -hmm. because it used to be men up until about 50 or 60 years ago. And then um, the women that ended up in med school, my mom was a doctor. Um, she's told me that she only learned to sew when she became a doctor. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. And she taught me how to do stitches on an orange when I was a kid. And she, she only knew how to do medical knots. Mm. So, um, so I don't know if I can contribute something smart to this part. Of the conversation. <laughs> well, on a, on a very basic level, just for the folks who may not be yeah. familiar with the terminology, why don't you tell us a little bit about, about the STEM to STEAM thing? Sure. So STEAM is, well, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. The acronym STEAM is an adaptation of that and includes an A for art. I have further uh, remodeled that phrase, and I tend to describe it as science, theater, engineering, art, and music. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, Math is the center of all science, and we can't do any science without it. So it's absolutely integrated, and technology comes out of engineering. So that's already in there. I was just going to say, sometimes I try to throw craft in there too, but then it turns into scream, which people don't necessarily love. <laughs> oh, I like scream. That'd be great. Oh, that's, that's worth doing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes I try to throw design in there mm -hmm. because of the understanding that the better design an object has, the more functional it also is. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. So Monica, you've talked a lot about that, that emotional connection to the, to the tactile as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those programs that you did working with either, you know, new immigrants or people who were struggling with transitions in their lives or, you know, how have you seen that activity open people up and, and have them, maybe speaking in a different way or exchanging in a different way? Sure. Well, one, one thing is going into classrooms because I really want, I really believe in children being given needle and thread mostly because I wasn't. <laughs> so I have this mm -hmm. thing, I'm on this mission <laughs> to, to make sure kids are still introduced to it. I mean, I'm only one person, but from that point of view, it was um, the boys in the room who, and I know that sounds really generalized and binary, but it was the, the boys who had never been given needle and thread for sure. If anyone had, it was usually a girl in the classroom and the boys, they just, they just ate it up and they would line up at the end of the class and say, can I please take this needle home? I want to keep sewing. And so like, just, just to kind of break down those barriers just felt amazing to see that to, to give people options that they maybe didn't know they had and then the other sort of really big story for me was one group in particular that I was asked to do a class for nobody spoke English most of them were refugees all were immigrants but most came from very scary backgrounds that none of us could probably imagine um, what they ran away from and left behind and people they lost and the violence they endured personally and in their families and um and so it was a women's group uh for newcomers less than six weeks in canada and they were from china africa uh eastern europe um syria and so they couldn't communicate with each other even right so there was this room full of people from different cultures different backgrounds um no way to communicate and and i brought in fabric and thread and 
a lot of, we did mostly collage. So a lot of like fabric, scissors, gluing, that kind of thing. Um, and with translators, I said, tell me your story. And they just, they just, it was, it was over an hour of just silence in the room. They worked and worked and worked and worked. Like they just, you know, there was no hesitation and it didn't matter whether it was beautiful what they made. It was a form of storytelling and ended up being a form of therapy. And I took all those pieces um, one by one and asked each woman through the translator, tell me what's your story here? What is this about? You know, what's this blue square for? And they would have huge, deep stories to tell. Um, the symbolism in what they were making was just incredible and and so that got to be, um, that was huge for them to share their stories with someone in a new country that's going to be their new home. And I framed all those up and put them in a, in a gallery, in a public space um, at a mall, actually, where there's people line up for the movie theaters all the time. So you're standing in line and you have to look at this stuff and their stories were there. And we did that around Canada Day. And I mean, it was just all such a feel good thing for them and a welcoming community for them and. And huge, they were bringing their families to come and see. I made this, you know, and <laughs> so just it was very life changing for them. Even though to look at the display might not have been like, "Wow, look at that amazing art," because that's not what it was about. It was the process. It was really about the process. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the most profound, uh, enlightening thing for me to experience um, was to see what the process, how it can heal, and yeah. So I had a similar kind of experience to Monica when I was living in Ireland and I did an artist residency in Donegal where artists were asked to um, engage the public in the topic of climate change in some way. <clears throat> and I ended up using wool as the material. And I had this uh, very strange kind of relationship to the people there because I was really an outsider from another country, but I was asking him about the wool. And I don't know if you've been to Ireland, but there are sheep everywhere. You know, so people, I, I would have assumed that people had a deep relationship with sheep and wool. Mm -hmm. um, but I would ask the, the kids about it when I would go into schools and they would tell me that they never used the wool. And um, I ended up teaching people how to spin and opening a spinning studio well, a wool studio for about six weeks. And we had, um, I don't know, probably a few hundred people through it over that time period and went to the schools and all that kind of thing. And again, it was similar to Monica in terms of the relationship that the kids had to the material once you showed them how yeah. they could use it. And they, you know, we made drop spindles. They wanted to take them home. They were really excited about it. They were fantastic at using the material. We did a, a, we did something called a spin-in where we took over the empty shop fronts of the village of Carandena because the village is basically emptied out through the recession that hit Ireland during that time. Mm -hmm. And we had all these people in the shop front spinning wool and they had never spun before. And they would remember their grandparents yeah. spinning, but nobody knew how to do it anymore. Wow. And the most remarkable thing about that project was that after the after we did it, I mean, we had a show in a gallery and we did lots of things and it was very beautiful and the people really engaged the material. But afterwards, a core of the group that was part of the studio ended up setting up their own spinning collective. And it continued. And one of the women during one of our workshops was so surprised about the whole process because she had been ordering wool from Australia in order to learn how to spin. And it was the strangest moment when she said, oh my God, I could have just gone to the farmer down the road. Well, this really actually ties in very well with the Citizens of Craft Manifesto that we're kind of using as our theme for the conversation today, which is nothing is newer than tradition. You are as much a fan of time-honored techniques as you are of their contemporary interpretations. So that idea that, that you know, you can have these deep-seated traditions and these technical skills and these materials that are tied into your culture and your your local, you know, 
history and your community, but you can get so easily disconnected from them. So, you know, that idea of nothing being newer than tradition, what, what were your initial thoughts when you heard that statement? And maybe does that resonate with this particular project or with your other work? And I'll just start with Seema again on that. Sure. Yeah. So during the project, we we took some of this wool from the farmer and we ended up knitting a pair of socks for him. And when we gave them back to him, his comment was, they're so precious, I'm not going to be able to wear them. And it was it was a great moment where he really understood the whole circle of this valuing of the material. And it, it was also a really great opportunity to just uh, be part of that community and help them to reinvigorate their own sense of value of this material um, that was so connected to their own tradition and their own landscape. Wow, beautiful. And Monica, what were your responses or your initial thoughts when you saw that manifesto statement, nothing is newer than tradition? It hit me very pers- on a very personal level because, um, because I didn't have a craft background. I had the art background. So it was at the age of 40 when I started to teach myself how to embroider and realize this is my medium, not paint. I want to make art with thread. Um, it was very like immediately I wanted to know how to do it right. Um, because I was part of the quilt guild and I know they have, I don't know, Seema, if you're familiar with this, but there's quilt police <laughs> in any of the jury shows, they want the mitered <laughs> corners and the quarter inch seams and everything. And the, everything has to line up and, some people, you know, shake their head at that, but there's a purpose to doing it right. It's so when you do wash and wash and wash these and use these quilts, they don't come apart. So it has to do with um, longevity and integrity of what you're making. It's like welding something and you don't have the joins right. Like, you know, it was so important for me at the beginning of my fine craft career to learn the proper ways of doing things so that my work would hold up. So I joined Bridge City Needle Arts Guild, which is under the umbrella of the Embroidery Association of Canada. And again, it was another, this room full of women that were these keepers of knowledge and skill. And they just, they showed me so many things, even I wasn't even threading my needle right to, to wear out the thread, like and how to not use knots in the back of your work. So for me, the technical aspect of learning, learning it correctly, um, getting getting a really solid foundation for my fine craft was just so important. And I was able to find that. So um and then I, and and with it, I do not do cross stitch. I don't do any kits or patterns that a lot of them will. Like I never fit into that guild. I felt a little bit, but they were still so welcoming because I was, I was, you know, stitching out prairie landscapes by, you know, just from my heart kind of thing and creating art with it. So I feel really lucky that these guilds exist. And they're, you know, in some ways, some are kind of dying out, but they really appreciate new members because they have so much to pass on and they might not have children or grandchildren to pass these things on to. So when new people join, boy, you are really like, they, they just scoop you up and teach you everything. It's quite wonderful. And I love that you've highlighted the importance of those guilds and organizations and those membership associations where people can share that beyond just the family connection, because there's been so many people on our, even on our podcast so far, but so many people that I come across who I often ask people, you know, how did they come to craft? And, and so many times people have said, oh, it was a, a family member or, you know, a mother or grandmother or a grandparent or, or a friend or an aunt or an uncle or whomever it might have been who it instructed them at the beginning or opened their eyes to it. Um, but that isn't always the case and it isn't always the way that people can come to those things. So being able to connect with other people in your community is so important. I remember coming back from my first meeting because I was, you know, in my 30s and everyone else was retired or older, (laughs) it seems. So I I remember being just elated that I had, I never had a grandmother. She passed away, you know, before I was born. So for me, it was like I had just adopted a room full of mothers and grandmothers. Like it was, I was, I was thrilled. Like I felt like I needed to be there on a personal level. And 
and these connections are important because it's it's not just the tactile skills that are meaningful or the act of making itself that is positive, which it of course is. Um, it's the work that comes out of it that's meaningful as well. It's it's a connection between our lives today and our past and our history. And and heirlooms sometimes you know they can get tossed aside or they can be cherished for a lifetime. They they hold these stories, and we talked a little bit about people having being being empowered to share their stories through craft. So I'm I'm curious to know from you know going from the skill side of the act of making to the the sort of final product, if you will. Um, do do you have any either cherished family heirlooms or or objects that you've collected in craft that really have meaning for you personally um, that that tie into your other interests or that tie into your craft interests? Uh, Seema, do you want to maybe share something from that perspective? fabrics that were made in the factory in India that used to be owned by my family. And, and I never really thought about my own connection to textiles or craft until I um, learned how to spin. And during that, that project in Ireland where we did the spin in and, you know, we were all talking about the, the, relationship of revolution and craft, actually like craft as a form of activism, essentially. Somebody in the group linked it to Gandhi and how Gandhi spun cotton to defy, yeah, to defy the British. And he made a particular type of fabric that was this rough kind of hand woven fabric. And that was the only thing he would wear. Um, and when that, when this woman in Ireland said that to me, I thought, oh, I'm repeating something. <laughs> really kind of obvious. <laughs> and, uh, and it reminded me that I came from a textiles, uh, family that I, I didn't really acknowledge that as, um, as my history, but my grandfather owned a, owned bar at the Sari house. And, and so I have these pieces of silk that were made in my grandfather's factory that I keep and they're hand embroidered and they're very beautiful and they're different kinds of blouses basically. Um, and they have, and the, he named that particular line of clothing that he produced. He named it after my grandmother, whose name was Thada. So they all have my grandmother's name on the label, on the tag. <laughs> and Monica, you know, do you have some maybe cherished family heirlooms that are craft related or, or again, pieces in your collection that you think are really meaningful that you would like to see become heirlooms yeah. perhaps? Well, my, my family came on a ship in the fifties, right after, you know, right out of East Germany after the war. So they came with nothing. So, um, so that's sad, isn't it? <laughs> but mm -hmm. there was a woman, um, who was, uh, I don't know, my, my, somehow related through marriage, but not my grandmother, an older woman who did make a baby quilt for me. And um, when I started quilting and had my own children, my mom said, I have your baby quilt. Do you want it? And I was like, I have a baby quilt. I didn't even know. And as soon as I, she gave it back to me, you know, it's maybe like a meter by, you know, it's just a small crib quilt. Um, I remember just every square of fabric I remember, I remember staring at, I remember touching, um, the polyesters were squares were, cause that was big in the seventies were still all, uh, really vibrant colors. The cottons were completely shredded and gone cause they're plant based. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and I remember the square I didn't like <laughs> because it had cowboys on it <laughs> and I like the ones with the flowers. So it's, it was, really amazing to hold that again and see that. So I've recovered the back and put a new binding on it. It's hanging on my wall. Um, oh, wow. And so, yeah. And then I have also a piece of wood uh, that my grandfather, my Opa Kinner had made from the first property they bought when they came to Canada um, at the lake. And it was, so we bought a cabin. And so it's a piece of wood with the last name Kinner uh, burnt. I think it's burnt into it. And he made that. Um, and I keep this chunk of wood like it's so there's something about it because he made it. Well, you mentioned that, you know, people who have come from other locations, who have relocated to Canada or elsewhere, or who maybe have gone through sort of traumatic or, or extensive experience to get to a new place. I think that craft can be really like a, a new way of forming a new homecoming for yourself in the sense that you may come with nothing or you may have nothing, but we can all make something. 
So you have that capacity to build that into your new life. Stories too have been really great. Like there's a lot of artists and crafts people on my mom's side and hearing their stories, you know, the, the theaters and the puppetry and the, the paper, the paper cutting with the little scissors, you know, the silhouette, the black, the things they did in the, the old country. I mean, all that stuff was destroyed. All the theaters were destroyed. So there's no legacy of that, but it's still pretty wonderful to have them tell the stories of what they remember of craft in their family. Like it's, it's what brought them together, you know? So, and it's what created community. It, it was the life of the towns, what the activities that they did, you know? So it's, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah. Seema, do you want to add to that? Thinking about how much craft, um, how I always go back to craft, basically, whenever I'm feeling kind of lost myself, like if I, because I have a, like the high, I kind of mix it all together in terms of high art practice and craft. Now they're all smushed together. But there was a while when I was like really a conceptual sculptor. And whenever I would feel like, I don't know what I'm doing, I would go back to the ceramic studio and throw cylinders and I would throw pots. And craft is just incredibly, um, it's, it's grounding and generous and makes one know that they're connected to a huge history that extends far beyond one individual. Like it connects you to all of humanity. It sounds so big and daunting as an idea, but it's true. So when I push my fingers into the clay, I feel like I'm part of that very long tradition of humans experimenting with clay for 30,000 years. Can I just bring up too, like the opposite of that too, like when it craft gets taken away, how that strips people Mm -hmm. and of their identities and their self-esteem and all this other stuff. And, and Asima, I don't know about you, but if I'm, if I'm traveling or away from my, my craft, it's like, do you get withdrawal? (laughs) I can't wait to get back in the studio. I'm going to go crazy. So need to stitch, need to work with my hands. So it's, um, it's so innate. It's really, yeah, it's bigger than, than people really admit to, I think. So it's very valuable. It's hugely valuable. I think withdrawal is something that we don't recognize very well in terms of making. And that I think that's why a lot of people are so stressed out is because they don't make things. And if you would just make something, you will feel better. Even if it's you know, go and sew a pair of pajamas, go and make some muffins, just do something where it's a bit messy. You're, you're following some kind of guidelines, but you're able to participate in the expression of it. You need to take time. You can't do 10 things at once. You have to focus and you get something at the end. Wow, that's good advice, I think, for everyone to, to go forward with. So I, I think we've come to the final segment of today's episode. And I almost I feel like we could talk for hours about all of these very interesting topics. Um, but I do want to run through the, the final segment today, which is our quasi fast paced, slow craft lightning round that we've been calling it. So I'm, I am going to ask you each a series of questions. And if you can share your immediate thoughts as fast as you can, let's start with uh, Monica first and Seema. We're going to follow directly with you afterwards. So I'm going to put you both on the spot for a minute. So one, two, three, let's go. Do you have a favorite tool? My cuticle scissors. <laughs> and Seema? A uh, drop spindle. What is your favorite gallery? I've never seen a gallery I didn't like, honestly. We have a big modern yes. art museum here now, the Ramey, and I have I go to pop-up shows and they're just as fulfilling. So yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and Seema? Yeah, right now in Winnipeg, my favorite gallery is at the Manitoba Craft Council because they have great new shows and they're diverse, they're by contemporary people, and they mix it with the Manitoba Craft Museum and Library show. So you get this uh, historical show one month that has you know, quilts that are fantastic. And then the next show is uh, 300 hooks made by a local uh, blacksmith, things like that. And that's the C2 Center for Craft? That's the C2 Center for Craft, yeah. Lovely. So what is one piece you wish you made yourself? Okay, this one, I looked up her name. So it's a, it's a piece, it's an installation, Neon Bloom by Amanda McCaver. 
incredible because it's tiny thread and it's larger than life. It's just amazing. So, wow. And Seema? Peter Tittenberger makes these fantastic ceramic crazy creatures that are so, they're out of this world. I can't even explain them. Um, yeah, they're wild. They're like, they look like sea creatures, but they're all from his imagination. What craft related book should everyone read? Monica? I really like the books by Beanie and Little John. They have a series of booklets that I find very inspiring because they don't teach a technique. They, they teach more about developing your own, your own uh, work. So, yeah. Homo Aestheticus by uh, Ellen Disanyake, which is about this theory that humans are essentially um, makers and that instead of just be, being called Homo sapiens, we would also be called Homo Aestheticus. Very interesting. Do you have a favorite quote? My mom used to always say, nothing to it but to do it. So... <laughs> One of them is make no small plans. And that was kind of the motto of my graduate school. And no, well, of the sculpture department, not of the school. And um, the other one is the cure for boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. What is your greatest weakness? Not being able to say no to commissioned requests. <laughs> Some are great. Some are like, why did I do this? <laughs> yeah. And Seema? Oh, time management. Yeah. I, it's like, I think that there's a teleporter <laughs> that can just get me to places. And so I don't a lot. I don't a lot in wiggle room. That's me. Who had the greatest influence on you? Monica? You know, I guess I could say it was the woman who made that quilt. Uh, my baby quilt. I, I would visit her at lunchtime across from my school, even though we weren't related. And she always had quilting pieces and rug hooking and braided rugs and weaving all this stuff. And she was always happy. And she had this sickled, grumpy husband. <laughs> but she was always pleasant. And she was surrounded by fiber arts. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> is, that, is that how you get happy in life? <laughs> so, so I think it's her. Uh, that would actually be my mom because she was a person, my mom was a person who really believed that life was an adventure and you could do lots of things and it was all just about choices and she was excited about the world in, in all its ways and she also really believed in making things better. So if she saw something that she felt like in her capacity she could make it better she really would um so i feel really yeah i feel really fortunate to have known her yeah last question of the lightning round is what do you wish more people understood about craft monica i wish that people understood or were aware that there are stories behind the work that people make so usually the question I get asked is, how long did that take? But I wish people would say, what's the story behind this, right? So it's just, just it's, there's way more there than we realize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Seema? I wish people understood that there is a difference between things made by hand and things simply made. And that the maker is part of the object. And maybe that's part of the story that Monica's referencing. But it's the value of craft that goes far beyond the thing. Call the end of our lightning round here. And I really, really want to thank both of you for taking the time to be here with us today and for participating in what I think was a really important conversation. And I'd just like to end by giving our listeners out there a chance to hear what you might have on the docket next. So what have you got planned for your next project or your next challenge? Monica? So I just put up a big thread painting show at the Ukrainian Museum of Canada, and that's on until February 2nd. So I'm going to plug that. That's here in Saskatoon. And, and Sima, what would you say is your next uh, project or challenge that you have coming down the pipe? I'm actually taking a leave for four months from my job so that I can make work again. 
And yeah, so that's great. I mean, part of my job allows me to have access to lots and lots of facilities. So it's, it's a bit of a back and forth, but I am working on a series of portraits that are uh, made with DNA. They're made from their DNA fragment portraits of people. Today's episode of the Citizens of Craft podcast has been made possible through funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and with the support of the many members of the Canadian Crafts Federation. Thank you to the artists who shared their thoughts and their time with us today. And thanks to all of you out there who took the time to listen. Continue the conversation online and see work from today's guests on the Canadian Crafts Federation, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. While you're out there on the web, be sure to visit citizensofcraft.ca. There you'll see the profiles of over 600 professional craft artists. You can search by artist, medium and location, even your own postal code to connect with artists where they live and work across the country. Are you a maker, a lover of all things craft? Want to make a local connection? Look up your provincial or territorial craft council today and join us next time on the Citizens of Craft podcast. Until then, craft on.